Good morning, my name is Alexis Louder, and I'm going to be talking about women composers in the Western art music tradition. Uh, my, my presentation is titled Invisible, the Unabated Suppression of Women Composers, which sounds pretty dramatic. So first of all, I would like to ask you all to think of a composer of classical music, any composer. Everybody knows at least one. Now, who thought of a woman? Have you ever heard of any women composers? I can tell from your faces, and this is very common, when people stop to think about whether they've heard of any women composers and realize they can think of none, they kind of see it as a personal fault. But really, women composers are extremely underrepresented uh, within classical music, and it's no surprise that you've never heard of any of them. According to UNESCO, only 5% of all classical works that are performed today are written by women. And these numbers are even more dismal when it comes to large scale works, such as orchestral works, in which barely over 1% of individual works that are performed today are written by women. Very few women composers are discussed in music history classes or music appreciation classes either. Feminist musicology is a branch of musicology that emerged in the 1970s, and it seeks to examine the relationship between music and gender, and the way that uh, gender roles um, affect the cultural role of music. This also coincided with the second wave of feminism, which was going on in the 1970s and brought about legal and cultural changes that changed the landscape for gender equality. Um, there was also increased attention given to women in other fields as well, literature, uh, to name just one, and um, gender studies classes um, gained widespread um, traction and became more popular. However, feminist musicology still has not been successful in bringing women composers into the cultural mainstream, as you can tell just by trying to think of any woman who composed classical music. I have been working on a thesis in which I am examining the historiography of 20th and 21st century writings about women composers, how they have been portrayed in people that write about them, if they're even written about at all, which is often not the case. So I've been examining books and articles, and there is a difference between the way men and women write about women composers at any point in time, and there's a pivotal shift in the way women composers are portrayed around the 1970s, which is unsurprising given the rise of feminist musicology and uh, the feminist movement in general. So before the 1970s, very few women composers were ever written about. And they were considered to be exceptions to their gender. And to be fair, they were exceptions to their gender in the fact that they were able to achieve success in a predominantly male-dominated field at a time when women were not seen as intellectual equals. But the reason they were seen as exceptions was not because of their success. It was because of the fact that they had creative talent at all, which was seen to be a male attribute. Very often, they were talked about only in the context of male composers who they were associated with, as was the case of Clara Schumann, who I will talk about momentarily. After the 1970s, they have been written about more often but still not with great frequency, and they're still not included in um, music history textbooks as often as male composers are. And of course, after the 1970s, um, it's very hard to find examples of uh, the assumption that women are intellectually or creatively uh, inferior to their male counterparts. However, there is 
a slight problem in the fact that most of the research that is being done on women composers is biographical and editorial rather than analytical. So this means that more attention is being paid to women composers and their lives, but their music itself is still not being thoroughly examined. Clara Schumann was a composer in the 19th century who is the most written about female composer of all time. And a lot of you have probably never heard about her, even though she's the most famous woman composer. She achieved fame at the beginning of the century as a child piano prodigy. Her husband, Robert Schumann, who is uh, in the top right uh, picture, was also a composer and a much more famous composer. Johannes Brahms, who is in the lower corner, uh, was a good friend of hers who was 13 years younger and supported her when her husband had a mental breakdown and spent the last two years of his life in an asylum and died. Um, and it has spawned over 150 years of speculation as to whether they were friends or lovers. This quote from a book titled Song Without End, The Love Story of Robert and Clara Schumann, written in 1959, is pretty typical of the way Clara has been portrayed as an accessory to her husband instead of as a composer in her own right. It reads, and because she made it the business of her life to live for him, she too is not forgotten. Through her labors and her endless devotion, she filled her husband's greatest dream, that posterity may regard us as one heart and one soul. This book is over 200 pages and only makes two mentions of Clara composing. Ethel Smythe was a slightly later woman composer and she is one of the rare women who is primarily known for writing large-scale works, especially operas. Uh, women have historically been confined to songs, um, vocal music, or other small-scale works, so it's pretty rare to see operas by women composers, even given the dearth of music by women composers that's played today. She was also active in the British women's suffrage movement, in the, at the beginning of the 20th century, which earned her a lot of criticism from males who wrote about her. She was also a successful author, writing, over, writing 10 books within her lifetime that were very successful, and most were autobiographical. So male authors often criticized her role in the suffrage movement, and we're going to look at a quote from Sir Henry Beecham, who was a very famous British conductor who was slightly younger than her about how he felt about the women's suffrage movement. Well, fortunately for her, if not the rest of the world, the Great War arrived in 1914 and put a stop to the efforts of the suffragettes. This was written, he said this in 1958, 30 years after British women had received equal, completely equal voting rights. So a big question that people have is why have I never heard of any women composers? There's a common assumption that if there were any great women composers, we would have, they would be famous. But it's important to know that talent in anything, especially composition, is not synonymous with fame. And to highlight that example, I would like to talk about a pretty well-known male composer named Johann Sebastian Bach. Bach was a church organist in the 18th century, and he died in 1750 in relative obscurity. Most of his contemporaries found his writing style to be very old-fashioned and stuffy and boring. After his death in 1750, most people forgot about him. One of his sons, C.P.E. Bach, who was also a composer, uh, worked in Berlin and was able to cultivate a small band of admirers of his father's music, and they continued for a hundred years to pass down his manuscripts. And then in the middle of the 19th century, almost a hundred years after his death, his popularity blew up immensely, and now he's considered to be one of the greatest composers of all time. His works weren't any less 
worthy of attention in the hundred years after his death than they are now. It's just that great talent does not always get the recognition it deserves. There have been several historical barriers to women composing that have also limited the number of women composers we hear about. And the biggest one of these is education. Until the 20th century, it was a very uneven playing field. Women had limited musical education opportunities, especially in the conservatories, where until 1896, they were not allowed to take composition or music theory classes. They were allowed to take performance classes, but they couldn't compose. And most women musicians came from musical families, including Clara Schumann, who was trained by her father. Another um, immense barrier that women faced was publication. Publishers were re reluctant to publish their works because they, did, they feared they wouldn't sell with a woman's name on them, and they weren't wrong in that regard, and they also did not believe in the merits of works by women. Often, women composers had to get permission from their father, uh, husband, or other male figures in order to be published. Fanny Mendelssohn Hensel is the sister of famous male composer named Felix Mendelssohn. She was expressly forbidden by her father to pursue music as anything other than a hobby, and she was discouraged from publication by her brother, but eventually encouraged by her husband. In 1820, her father Abraham wrote her a letter with this quote, music will perhaps for him, Felix, become a profession, while for you it will always be only an ornament and never become the fundamental baseline of your existence and conduct. Remain in this conviction and behavior, for they are feminine, and only the feminine is becoming to women. And another um, barrier to publication were the expenses involved. Uh, it could be very expensive to get publishers to publish your works, and of course, Really, until the 1970s, women had extremely limited economic freedom. The final barriers, which I have lumped together, are performance and critical reception. Uh, women composers had difficulty having their works performed, especially if they were large-scale works. Ethel Smythe had to fight tooth and nail to get her operas to be even considered for performance. They were also not taken seriously by music critics who, surprise, were predominantly men. The last thing that needs to be addressed is why it's important to include women composers within the music education curriculum. For one, inclusion of women is part of a well-rounded music education. Uh, there have been many great women composers, and by not exposing students to works by women composers, we're essentially uh, limiting them to works by only half of the human population. Also, women composers provide important role models for younger women, whether they are studying music or just listening to listeners of music. And last but not least, women have written many worthwhile musical works that deserve to be listened to and appreciated. Thank you. Uh, kind of. Um, have you ever heard of the Guerrilla Girls movement? Yes. I know they've operated in art and literary fields, but I didn't know if they had worked in music before. Well, I didn't. I, for this, I stuck to the classical sphere. I'm familiar with uh, like the Guerrilla Girls movement and the Riot Girls of the 90s, but I didn't know if they had press for more education on this front or not for I'm not composers, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> you like find their secret email address and say, listen, this is an issue. <laughs> I have a question. So you talk about a woman like a composer, right? So is any like piece written by composed by the woman actually has any different from the male's work? What well, what is the fundamental characteristics about women's work? Well, that's a good, great question. So every composer has their own unique um, compositional voice. Um, traditionally, um, in a music theory and history texts of the past they would actually use words like masculine and feminine to describe certain types of, types of um, music. 
So it was assumed that women's music would be more um, more pretty and le have less substance to it, whereas music by men is more aggressive and driving. Um, but there, it's interesting because many of the women composers who have received attention in the past, um, such as Ethel Smythe especially, um, were praised and noted just because their music was, quote, masculine sounding. But then they were also criticized for not being feminine enough. Thank you. Thanks, Texas. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Lawrence. And today I'm going to be talking about a research project that I am in the process of proposing. Uh, and it's entitled Imaginary Worlds in Art Therapy, Active Imagination and Self-Representation in Van Art. So I focus on the idea of working with fans, particularly I want to work at a comic con and do volunteer based uh, art, and art directives with them. I feel like this population actively uses representation uh, and character identification within their interests and I think that's something that could be possibly explored within the therapeutic setting. I think it could be beneficial in developing therapeutic goals, develop, developing connection and communication. Uh, some resources to support this and previous like work in other fields of uh, bibliotherapy, identification with book characters, themes, narratives, uh, active imagination film written by, uh, sorry, John Izod, uh, characterized going to the movies as being a possible out of body experience where you can experience the events happening in the movie but still be physically and mentally safe in your own body. Uh, and participatory cotton culture is often what fan culture is referred to as uh, because they take the media information that they are uh, <laughs> exposed to, uh, interpret it, uh, redefine it, and then they spread it out into the world and share it with others. Uh, if this is a field that is growing in interest. There is more uh, support for pop culture within the therapeutic setting. These are some of the books from the series from Dr. Travis Langley. Uh, his, work, his work is very interesting and he's very popular. He's known as the superhero therapist right now. Uh, and he runs uh, courses at a university, Henderson University in Arkansas, that focuses on the psychology of superheroes. Uh, This culture is now recognized as active consumerism, reshaping and recirculating media as it is being produced. Fan culture has perme permeated multiple genres, cultural representations, and thematic narratives. And, as, and they are as diverse as any client we may see outside of the popular cultural atmosphere. Uh, next slide. Oh, okay. That's right. That's right. Uh, so fairy tales and fantasy, they're, fairy tales are kind of a root for our modern story tell, storytelling and some of the narratives that are popular and classic, like the most familiar uh, fairy tales are from the German, uh, the Brother Grimm. Uh, some of the themes that are familiar are folk tales that are focused more on a moral aspect. Uh, Bodingheimer addresses audience as a source for the generation of original folk and fairy tales. So the generation of the themes found there were dependent on the audience acceptance and redistribution of these tales, sharing them amongst themselves and their family members. Uh, so and a few of the other themes include tales of fairyland, so that would be an escapist kind of situation. It would be more of a didactic journey where the main character would either prove their purity and goodness or they would go through a transformative process where they would become a better character. Uh, such an example is from Mother Holly, and a modern interpretation of that would be Labyrinth, the classic from 1986. Uh, another type of fairy tale would be The Rise, the familiar rag to riches Cinderella story. Modern interpretation of that, of course, is Pretty Woman. Um, and as for restoration, that's where a character falls out of good standing, such as Snow White having to retreat from her stepmother, and she, but she eventually reclaims her title, and a popular a pop culture interpretation of that could be Iron Man. Uh, creative process and world development. Uh, 
Jeff Vandermeer's text, Wonder Book, The Illustrated Guide to Creating Imaginative Fiction, uh, it analyzes the creative process in developing self-made worlds and the depth and awareness of the creator's role in creating this fictional reality. Uh, it identifies personal narratives and symbols to explore further within the therapeutic atmosphere, uh, identifying with particular characters, uh, narrative plots for your protagonists, uh, roadblocks along the way could be identified as personal blocks in, uh, in the creator's life. Uh, and it emphasizes the role of creative play and expression in development of stronger um, imaginative imagination and how it can facilitate communication amongst peers, family members, and in the therapeutic relationship as well. Uh, it also addresses that perception and imagination on the individual le level is actually a result of larger perceptual awareness of the world itself. So you are a product of the world that you live in. So your imagination and your perception is colored by those experiences. So any creation that you make, including a fantasy world, would be colored by your personal experiences. For this research project, uh, I'm, as I said, I'm focusing on Comic-Con participants because I feel like that's the population of people who are already actively using these kind of skill sets. Uh, and I'd like to explore more their usage of it and how I can adapt it to uh, art therapy directives. I would include an informed consent process uh, with manila envelopes and tracking numbers to provide a not an anonymous uh, participation but if they would like to get the results of the, uh, of the research project, I am going to have a separate email uh, list set up so that anyone, who, even if they don't want to participate, can get, receive the information. Uh, I will need signed photo release if they want to take their artwork with them after the process is finished and permission to record the, set, the interview process following the art directives. I do want to do a demographic survey, but notably I do not want to include diagnostic information, specifically because within the Comic-Con setting, uh, the, the, the people with autism spectrum disorder especially have been pushed out and feel like they've been uh, excluded from conversations about being autistic. And they embody a large part of this, of this uh, population, specifically being fa fans and fan culture. And I do not want to fit, make them feel like I am addressing this to normalize them or to make them fit more within the social context. If, if anything, I want this to be a coping tool for them if they want it and a better means of expression and communication on our part because I feel like as neurotypical individuals, we are not meeting their needs and that they don't have to meet our expectations. We need to meet their needs. Uh, for the for the art directives, I intend to use crowns, markers, color pencils, and eight, and eight and a half by 11 drawing pads. So developing, the, I'm calling it a treatment goals assessment. Uh, the three treatment goals I hope to identify with this uh, directive are is character identification, exploration of conflict through visual narratives, and safe place processing. It's based off of three different types of assessment styles. Um, sorry. Stimulus, attraction, uh, stu stimulus attribution is where a person attributes meaning to an ambiguous stimulus with attributions determined in part by stimulus characteristics and in part by the person's cognitive style, motives, emotions, and need. That would be referred to uh, in the first directive of identifying a personal favorite fictional world. So it's not an ambiguous stim stimulus, but I believe it still has a therapeutic interest. Uh, the next one is constructive. The generation of test responses requires the client to create or construct a novel image or written description within the parameters defined by the tester. So I, I'm going to go individually over the prompts, but the third prompt is creating your own uh, fictional world in a drawing. So that is within the constructive assessment. And comprehensive art, art therapy assessments, uh, person, people will engage with a variety of media and yield information integrated from multiple sources, so including the art directive, uh, the art therapist's uh, direct observation of the art process, and a following interview process following the art activity. Uh, process questions. The first prompt is draw a representation of a favorite fictional place from popular media. So that could be included books, movies, TV shows, video games, uh, any popular media that they find interest in. 
and I have following that uh, three process questions for this prompt. Can you really describe what world you chose and why you were interested in it? Do you have a favorite character? Did you include them in the drawing? Why are they your, are they your favorite? Do you identify with this character? What is going on in the picture? Is this a specific moment from the show, book, movie, or is it one of your own design? This is to reinforce the therapeutic goal of character identification because who your favorite character is and their motives and their interests really can shape the therapist's understanding of who you are. The second prompt is reflect on a time of difficulty. Uh, once you have, draw yourself from that moment in the fictional world previously illustrated. So the idea is taking the, is taking the client or participant uh, in their experience of a trial or conflict and letting them be in a safer, more controlled environment that they feel comfortable in mentally. So the four questions following this would be, can you briefly describe the conflict you experienced if you feel comfortable doing so? How does it change the situation if the conflict took place in this world instead of reality? Do you feel like you have more control over others' actions or behaviors, series or events, outcomes? Why or why not? Could you have handled the situation differently if you were a part of this world? The idea is that people who have interest in fictional worlds have more control and manipulation of their um, the series of events going on because they are facilitating interest and th they will feel more comfortable than addressing it in a real life setting. The final prompt is draw an imaginative, imaginative world of your own design and it's kind of a free association thing where you can draw something from a previous memory, a happy place, or it can be a fantasy such as I want to be on a beach while I'm stuck at the office. Um, the process questions following that are how is this world different from the world you previously drew? Is this world closer to your reality rather than a fictional portrayal? Why or how? Is this world one that you've imagined before the session? If so, how have you used this world before? The idea is that this is a safe place that the participant has used before and I want to understand like their motives for using it and how, the, and how they interpret those and how they can continue use of it. For the data analysis part of my uh, assessment, uh, I'm adapting existing scales and I understand that uh, invalidates the, the reliability and the validity of the scales that have been proven before, but I don't think as they are, they um, are appropriate for the content of my study. For example, the draw story assessment is meant to evaluate depression and aggression. And while that is all very good, those are not what I'm searching for. Uh, but the scales can be used to associate and to assess emotional content and self-image and I believe that can help with my understanding of character identification. And they have a third scale, use of humor, in regard to an ordinal scale of positive or negative features and I think that that could uh, associate with the manipulation and conceptualization of the conflict in the second prompt. The formal elements of art therapy scale are very rigid. Uh, and they are meant to be a diagnostic and for realistic perception and skill level in art. Uh, that is not appropriate for my study because all of the fictional, popular, cultural, you know, the dragon doesn't look like a human. <laughs> so it's not realistic if they identify with a main character that is not necessarily a human. So, uh, but it can be used for problem solving and it can be used for uh, characteristic identification. And as far as content analysis, uh, it's a search for consistent characteristics or language of themes in relation to the, the treatment goals. So that would become, that would come from the interview process and listening to their words and their uh, adaptations and their interest in the world that they picked. So here are many references, but thank you guys. Do you have any questions? Kind of swampy with that, but thank you. Good morning. Uh, today I'll be talking to you about a small portion of my thesis comparing the fossil biotas of the late Carboniferous Garnet and Hamilton Quarry localities 
in eastern Kansas. Both these localities are really important scientifically because we have individual species described specifically from each of those localities and only found there. Uh, what I've done here is comparing both their biotas, so fauna and flora, which nobody has done since, well, Hamilton, which was discovered in the 70s. So overview of this, I'm looking to see how our paleo ecosystem has changed because we have these two sites being temporarily one to seven million years difference in age. So to do this, for this portion of it, is looking at that taxa specifically to see if we have anything that's related or if we have the exact same taxa at both localities. Now to do this, I'll just go through a brief description of the localities themselves through the invertebrates, vertebrates, plants, spores, and pollen, and give you an overall conclusion there. What we have here is the Hamilton Quarry located in Greenwood County and Garnett located in Anderson County. First we have Garnett, which is the oldest localities both in terms of discovery and in age. It was discovered in 1931 where a lot of work was done before World War II and then sort of got going again after World War II. Uh, the age is approximately 303 to 306 million years, so well before dinosaurs or all that. The fossils themselves, which I'll be showing you the rock layers on the next slide, are confined only to the Rock Lake Shale, which in this locality is confined to a depression. Also, this locality has been described as being an estuary or lagoon based on the lithology and taxa found there. So we have our nice site located there, circled. And here's our lithology. So all the rock or all the fossils are confined to the Rock Lake Shale. Up here, all the fossils are coming out of up here and right there in these depression areas. And it's restricted to those parts. This is a reconstruction done in 1952 of what it might have looked like at the time that we had animals living there with our Petrolacosaurus kansiensis along the lagoon with conifers nearby. Then we have the Hamilton Quarry, which, while discovered in 1964, was not studied until the 70s. Its age is a little bit ambiguous because it is a paleo channel. So our current estimation is 299 to 303 million years of age. The reason it's ambiguous is I said, this is a eight kilometer long paleo channel, but what we're lacking is the capping sequence for it. So we will find the paleo channel deposits and the units it is cutting into, flanking it, but we do not have anything overlaying it. The paleo channel itself more or less disappears going into the ground in the north with very little study happening in the south. Along the way we have a basal conglomerate which is typical for channel deposits going along the entire eight kilometer length. Now there's two major areas of study here. The main quarry area which ESU owns and manages and the marlin quarry which is still an active quarry. And this has been interpreted classically as a stream that grades into an estuary with the north being fresh water going farther and farther south getting into the more marine waters. So here is a simplified cross section of Paleo Channel. What we have here is the standard lithology versus what we see at the Paleo Channel. It cuts through our lower members of the Topeka limestone Calhoun Shale and into the upper Urban Creek Limestone, member of the Deer Creek Limestone. Fragments of these are found in the basal conglomerate. It's, the channel itself is compared of alternating limestone and mudstone layers where all of our fossils are coming out of one specific limestone layer. And this is a reconstruction from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science of what the Hamilton Quarry looked like at its time of everything living there. So methodology here 
is I found every paper published about Garnett, Hamilton, went through there to find the information. Created a list going from our highest level of classification of kingdom all the way down to species and for plants variety. And then we just looked to see what was there. So in general, they both somehow have the same number of taxa, but you can see the large differences in our invertebrates, vertebrates, and our floras are about the same. In microfloras, there is a bias in study is that there's only been one really limited study at Hamilton compared to an extensive one at Garnett. So first off, our aquatic invertebrates. Garnett has 17 versus the 39 at Hamilton. Both have forams, sponges, echinoderms, crustaceans, annelids, mollusks, brachiopods, and bryozoa. However, here we see the differences. Is Garnett, we have specifically myelinoid forams, which are absent from Hamilton. We have a coral. Mollusks are only bivalves. And in brachiopods, we have three taxa. At Hamilton, we have eurypterids, shrimp, a second annelid worm, and gastropods. This is a nice picture of our eurypterid. So we have some biases here. There's an identification bias favoring Hamilton for forams, cryonoids, and ostracodes. They've been more heavily studied there. Whereas at Garnett, we have the bryozoans have been more heavily studied. So what can we tell they're similar is we have those listed, those uh, genuses I've listed off earlier, but specifically we have three genuses of sporobiferous, myelinella, and neospirifer found in both. Garnett, we saw the coral, Hamilton, gastropods, eurypterid. Overall, if the biases didn't play any effect, we could say Hamilton has a greater diversity there. Then we have our terrestrial invertebrates. Six at Garnett versus 10 at Hamilton. Garnett and Hamilton both have scorpion, cockroaches, and these ancient six-winged insects. However, we do see major differences. Whereas at Hamilton, we have millipedes, a second type of arachnid, only one cockroach versus the two we find at Garnett. Also, walking sick crickets and our ancient dragonflies. And these are some examples of those found at Hamilton. We have our millipede, our ancient dragonfly, and our whip scorpion. Now, similarities, on a broad sense, we have scorpions, cockroaches, those ancient six things, but there are no taxa that's the same. We see that the Hamilton are younger versions of those specific taxa, as is expected, whereas the Garnet is more primitive. Then we have our aquatic vertebrates. So Garnet, there's only four versus the 13 found at Hamilton. Specifically, Garnet, everything is disarticulated, so there's not really complete specimens. What we can tell there are three sharks and see the camp of fish. Whereas Hamilton, we have conodonts, which are a sort of sea worm, five types of sharks, a freshwater fish, acanthodes, ray fin fish, and some lobe fin fish. Well, the differences are obvious, with more being found at Hamilton, there's obviously more there. These are what we assume the Garnet varieties look like, where we have some reconstructions of the Hamilton. And the Acanthodes, where we see both juvenile and adult forms there, suggesting breeding was happening at Hamilton Quarry. Now, similarities, we have our Xenocanthid shark, with this is a typical form of one, our form shark, those have weird bodies, and our coelacanthic fish are found in both. Now, Hamilton, we have our conodonts, ray fin fish, lung fish, acanthodes, other lobed fin fish, which are all absent from Garnett. Again, Garnett specimens all disarticulated, so we don't know if they were living there or transported in after death. 
whereas Hamilton are mostly found articulated with several of them having soft tissue preservation. Now for our terrestrial vertebrates, both of them have tentaxa. Both of them have our amphibians, reptiles, and separated out our synapses, which are the reptile branch that would lead to mammals. <coughs> our amphibians there, uh, Garnett, have two forms. Our patricomorphs are the more amphibian forms, which would lead to our modern amphibians, and the reptilomorphs, which are more reptilian and would lead to our reptiles eventually. Whereas at Hamilton, we only have the patricomorph forms. Reptiles, Garnett has the oldest known diapsid, Petrolacosaurus cansiensis, which is only found at Garnett, most of which are fully articulated skeletons. Now at Hamilton, we do have a, another diapsid, which is more advanced than the one from Garnett, Garnett and is related to it. We also have a Catranomorph reptile. Then we get to our synapsids, which is the oddity. So at Garnett, synapsids are all exclusively eupolycosaurs. Specifically, we have the daphosaurids, our ophiacodontid, and sphenacodontids. Now at Hamilton, we have a primitive form, which is the caseid, which is not a eupolycosaur, but has been classically grouped in with polycosaurs. Then we have our eupolycosaurs, where we have the most basal form there of a veriponid. We have two adaptosaurs and an ophiacodontid. Now, this is the major differences here. None of these taxa are the same with the exception of one specific. The anathosaurus had a stromium, which is found in both. And these are our reconstructions of the garnet forms, Petrolacosaurus, our Spinacodontid, Ophiacodontin, and our Edaphosaur, and those found at Hamilton with our diapsid, our caseid, our veriponid, and again, the Edaphosaur. Now, on a broad sense, they have similar biotes there. But with the exception of Edaphosaurus and Sturium, none of these are the same taxa. Garnett does overall appear more primitive, as would ex be expected. However, it has this phenacodonts, which are closer to mammals than what is found at Hamilton now. Hamilton is supposed to be the younger site, but we have the more primitive forms there and lack our phenacodonts. Then we have our megaforms. 26 at Garnett, 28 at Hamilton. Lycopods, there's forms and horsetails seed ferns, conifers, pretty much the same community set up in both localities. Difference being in the specific taxa there and the numbers. At both sites, conifers are the most abundant ones found. However, at Hamilton, clearly the conifers are the most diverse, whereas at Garnett, the seed ferns are more diverse. So here are some of our forms. We have a fern annularia, seed fern, and then our conifers. Now similarities, again, they both have similar setups. But specifically, we have the annularia, the neuropterus, our two genuses found in both, and specifically the one taxa exactly, which is Clipus filiformi vertus mori found in both. Otherwise, none of these plants are found at either side. Microflora, uh, as I said earlier, there is a bias here, where there's more study at Garnett, but the important thing is we have a fungal spore versus no fungus. Now overall, we see that Garnett is most likely that lagoon with our seed ferns being dominant and more terrestrial influenced, whereas Hamilton is more aquatic influenced where we have conifers being a dominant plant along the edges of the stream, but we have mostly freshwater invertebrates and vertebrates living there. So, ending thoughts here is that the communities themselves are similar, where they, they turn over is in the dominant taxa. Garnett, again, is more primitive as expected, whereas Hamilton 
has the oddity of the synapses being more primitive. Garnett's more terrestrial, where Hamilton is more freshwater or aquatic. Uh, acknowledgements. And for your amusement, my numerous number of slides and questions if I have time. Yes. You know, early in your presentation, I, I think you used the, the term paleo channel. Yes. I, I think I know what that is just from the way the word's constructed, but to be sure, could you give us a little definition of what you mean by a paleo so channel? So, a paleo channel, by definition, is a channel, so like your river stream channel, but paleo meaning that it takes place in the past. So, the way we find those is that channel itself is filled in by some other type of rock than the surrounding. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Uh, yes, this is Brandy Nance, and I am John Leach. Uh, we are enrolled in Professor Webb's uh, Eco Criticism in Pop Culture course, and in that course, we've been doing research using the eco critical lens. Through our research, we found an interesting intersection between my research focus in folklore, matching up with Brandy's work in how land access and access to environmental protection, there's a, a bit of a divide there that, again, intersect at this point of folklore. Okay. And we're going to lead into a presentation by giving you a rundown on eco-criticism. So as the slide says, eco-criticism explores the ways in which we imagine and construe the relationship between human and the environments in all areas of cultural production. So let's break this down a little bit. What does this really mean? Eco-criticism helps us read cultural artifacts in our society. That would be billboards, films, TV shows, magazines, literature, and basically anything we consume as a culture, and then relate it back to the physical environment taking an earth center approach. And that definition is from Gerard, a textbook we were studying. So why do we care about eco-criticism? Well, because of this, the green ceiling. The green ceiling was a, is a term introduced by Green 2.0, and that's a website. They did a comprehensive study of government organizations, non-government organizations, of environmental agencies. So despite increasing racial diversity in the United States, the racial com composition of environmental organizations and agencies is not increasing. And as you can see, we have a 12 to 16 percent green ceiling, meaning that 12 to 16 people, percent of people are of a racial diversity. So this leads to unconscious bias, discrimination, and things like that. So with such a pervasive inequity between our uh, makeup of our ethnic groups within the United States and then those represented in the environmental protection movement, we began to ask ourselves, why is this so common yet uh, not seen in the fore of society? And it's because of this concept of the logic of domination. Yes, which as you can see is discrimination, oppression, denial of experiences and rights, based on race and other factors. So think about this in relations to the images we are just, we are gonna look at in a little bit. If society says you don't fit through the images, you're gonna begin to believe it. Which leads us to this slide. This is a very simple Google image search. All I asked Google to do here was return me pictures of children in nature. This is taking a screenshot just from the first few rows of the <coughs> picture uh, as you can see, who is dominating these images? Mainly one race of children. So if you are a minority child looking at these images on the internet, one could infer that they don't, they would think maybe they don't belong here. That would be the conclusion they might. That nature isn't made for them or they're not supposed to be in nature if they don't match with what they see. Correct. And another good thing to point out here is the innocence of the children here, how they're portrayed, and we'll kind of go into this a little bit later in the presentation. So in an essay, White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Backpack, Peggy McIntosh said, I can easily buy posters, postcards, picture books, greeting cards, dolls, toys, and children's magazines featuring people of my race, as you can see is prevalent here. So I did another simple Google search, children in inner cities. 
So we'll look at that slide. Look what happened here. Another very simple Google search. And you can see one race is prevalent. And then Peggy McIntosh goes on again to say, if these things are true, based on what, the quote we just looked at, this is not such a free country. One's life is not what one makes it. Many doors open for certain people through no virtues of their own. So a pernicious and pervasive sense of institutionalized racism exists uh, in the world, in the images that we consume. Is this uncommon or unheard of? And the intersection of our research comes where uh, we say no. The logic of domination it persists throughout our culture, extending as far back into something as innocent as our folklore and our fairy tales. Uh, these are the stories that we listen to at our mother's knee, and folklore shapes our cultural consciousness and our identity as a people. Uh, Jack Zips, a researcher at Princeton University, uh, in a book came out in 2012 on the importance of folklore in our culture, talks about how fairy tales inform the human disposition into action. They influence how we interact with each other and how we wish to transform ourselves and control our environment. The logic of domination involves establishing criteria and ascribing those criteria to different parties, be it in a uh, social setting, in a story. In the case of Hansel and Gretel, we have the categories of old versus young, ugly versus pure, innocent versus tainted, and then we ascribe value to those categories, to the point where we value the children Hansel and Gretel that we are applauding at the end of the story when they kill an old lady. Uh, logic of domination, folklore, these are important because not just old folk tales, but new fairy tales carry this logic of domination with them. Uh, 1985, the movie Legend was produced by Ridley Scott. This is very much in the vein of a modern folk tale. We see the logic of domination play out with the major characters in this story. Darkness represents modernity, a removal from nature, and all things classically evil, while Jack, the protagonist, represents a closeness to nature, an innocence, a purity, uh, very much like Hansel and Gretel. Uh, within the categories that separate them, there is value placed on this character, and again, intersecting with what Brandy's research found, we see uh, nice, beautiful, innocent Tom Cruise uh, representing the dominant racial group uh, in this country. So, moving away from stories and folklore, what are the implications of this in the real world? Which brings us back to the green ceiling. So your narratives, cultural narratives, all throughout, lead us back here. If you, if you can see, we have a, an ad here from the National Parks Conservation Association again showing one particular family one particular type of family so who gets to protect nature one could say that it would be that family versus other families this is where logic of domination in the images and the cultural artifacts this is where it rears its ugly head and as you can see again here it's broken down the staff diversity a little bit 12.4 percent non-government 15 government foundation 12. so this is where the narratives lead us and if we do not change our narratives, this is where the narratives will continue to lead us. These are the implications. When you're small as a child, you're not gonna see yourself in a government organization protecting nature. Thus, we won't have the diversity. For your entertainment, our sources. Oh, we're excited, beautiful. Any questions? So pay attention to, oh yeah. So where, what are you going to do next with this project? Or the next one? Well, we're, uh, we're both going to be writing papers on Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're writing extensive papers and um, can you continue to explore the implications of different artifacts and images and things in society, so. Yeah. 
I've been I've been interested in folklore for many years, and I've been very appreciative of learning about the eco-critical perspective and being able to use that as a lens to critique and analyze uh, these stories that I've known my whole life. And I've had a particular interest in children's issues. I my first degree is in early childhood education, and so a lot of my creative writing work centers on children and children's issues. So that's what led me to children and images and how they're portrayed. Yes, sir. Yes. When you're defining folklore, are you looking at it as a global picture where every different area, different cultures have different folklores, or are you looking at it specifically at the European folklore perspective, which being uh, Caucasian is what we all grew up with? So, to your question, I'm defining folklore in a global sense, but to the question behind the question, uh, for the purposes of our research, it is uh, focused on Western folklore. A lot of what we look at in uh, eco-criticism as the discipline stands now has a very Western focus, at least in uh, literature, from my experience. Yes? Uh, for the folklore, uh, do you find that, it sounds like you've looked at globally at folklore, so do you find that each, that cultures tend to have their, represent their own as the the pure, or the one close to nature, and the other, does it usually represent an outside group, or is it, I mean, is it consistent with European, the trend with European folklore? Uh, that innocence is always depicted as close to nature in folklore, no. Uh, and that's not even the case in all of Western folklore. Uh, illustrating, say, through Hansel and Gretel, uh, we see the logic of domination playing out where we uh, ascribe value to that which is close to nature uh, in this case. But uh, what's coming to mind, there is a Japanese folk story I was just reading the other day uh, about a young man who travels to a sea kingdom and that makes him closer to nature, but then when returning to the human world to visit his parents, uh, he loses everything. So that sort of trope exists in folklore from all over the world, but then you'll get uh, something like Puss in Boots, uh, where yes, it's a cat, but that, that cat is actually somewhat removed from nature because he's tromping around, in, or she is tromping around in some nice boots. The original cat's female, the Antonio Banderas version came later. Okay, well thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Morning everyone, my name is Hui Qian and I come from Dr. Eric Young's lab. So today I'm going to talk about Macro 26A inhibits the growth and invasiveness of malignant melanoma and directly targets MIKFG. I'm going to introduce this topic from these four parts backgrounds, methods, results, and conclusions. So first, what is melanoma? Melanoma is the most aggressive type of skin cancer derived from melanocyte cells. In about 76,000 new melanoma were diagnosed in 2016 in the United States. One out of 50 persons will develop melanoma during their lifetime and moreover, the five-year survival rate for melanoma is less than 20%. Thus, looking for an effective therapy for treat melanoma is very important. So we found microRNA. microRNA is a class of small non-coding RNAs. It can play dual role in the cancer cells. Some microRNA can work as tumor suppressor RNA, the other can work as onco microRNAs. In our project, actually, we find micro-26A can work as tumor suppressor microRNA in the melanoma progression. So what is mechanisms for microRNA works? Actually, microRNA there are two mechanisms for microRNA to exert, exert gene regulation. 
First mechanism is macro-RI can best pair with the target gene on MRI and resulting MRI degradation. The other mechanism is macro-RI can best pair with the 3-UTR of the target gene and block the translation. The both, the both outcome of these two mechanisms is that the protein level of target gene will decrease. So here are questions we will, uh, we will address in this project. First is, is macro 26 a cytotox to the malignant melanoma cells? Does macro 26 a inhibit or enhance the invasiveness of melanoma cells? Does macro 26 a affect cell cycle progression and induce apoptosis? Does macro 26 a exist potential target in melanoma cells. So here is method that we used in this project. We used two melanoma cell lines. One is SKMEL28, the other is WM1552C. And we used MTT assay to detect cell viability, transwell invariant assay, flow cytometry for cell cycle assay, and apoptosis assay. We also did Western blood and in vivo assay. So here is the results from MTT. So I mentioned before that MTT is detects the cell viability. As we can see, compared with the control group, the macron 26 a can significantly decrease the cell viability in these two melanoma cell lines. And also, we use transwell assay to detect the cell invasiveness of melanoma. This is the result of cell invasiveness, and we also did the bar graph and the statistic analysis for that result. So as we can see, compared with the control group and the negative control group, when we transfected microRNA into melanoma cells, it can significantly reduce the cell, cell invasiveness. So based on the previous study, we know that microRNA can reduce cell viability as well as reduce the cell invasiveness. So we want to know that Macron reduce cell viability and invasiveness by arresting cell cycle. So we did the cell cycle assay over here, and we also analysis these results. So the G1, G0, G1, S, G2, and M represents the different phase of the cell cycle. We can see compared with the control and negative control group, Actually, macro 26 a can significantly increase the cell number in G0 and G1 phase. That means macro 26 a arrested the cell cycle and G0 and G1 phase. We also did apoptosis assay. So this quandary means that cell is still alive, and this quandary means that cell is undergo apoptosis. So we also analysis the data for this results. The y-axis represent a, the percent of apoptotic cell. The x-axis represents the different group. So we can see compared with the control and the negative control group, the different concentration of micro 26 a can significantly increase the apoptotic cells the percent of apoptotic cells in both these melanoma cell lines. So based on our previous study, we know that macro 26 a can reduce cell viability and the cell invasiveness and arrest cell cycle and G0 and G1 phase, moreover, induce, uh, induce apoptosis. So we want to know Think about the mechanism of macro 26 a So we want to know that there exists any potential target, potential gene target for macro 26 a So we go to the macro RNA databases trying to find the potential target. We do find two potential targets for macro 26 a 
One is MITF, the other is MAP four K three. So we did the G, uh, sequence alignment between Micro twenty six A and these two potential target, and we can see Micro twenty six A actually works better with MITF. So we decided to choose MITF as our potential target. So in order to examine the relationship between microarray and the potential target MITF, we did Western blot experiment. So these two bands, these two bands means the different isoform of MITF protein, and the gap DH is the internal control for this experiment. So in SKMEL28 cell line, we can say compared with control and negative control group, our upper band actually disappeared. That means micro 26 a can significantly decrease the expression level of MITF. And in our the other cell line, WM1552C cell line, we can say that after we transfected micro 26 a into melanoma cell lines, the expression level of MITF, that two bands become faint than control and ex uh, negative control group. So that means micro 26 a did downregulate the expression level of MITF. So even if we know that micro 26 a may be target MITF, don't regulate the expression level of MITF, but we still cannot sure that the decreased cell viability is caused by down regulated of MITF. So we did the knockdown experiment. We we have the SIRNA MITF1 and MITF5 and transfected these two SIRNA into melanoma cell lines respectively. And we find that compared with control and negative control group, when we transfected SIRNA into melanoma cells, it significantly decreased the cell viability. So we know that microRNA downregulated MITF can decrease the cell viability in melanoma cell lines. And we also did in vivo test for micro 26 a So this black dot and these tumors, it may be very, you cannot see very clear. So we have the control group, negative control group, and the different concentration of melanoma. We measure the tumor, we measure the tumor on mice every three days and to uh, use the equation to estimate the tumor volume. Here is our line graph for the results. The y-axis represents the tumor volume and the x-axis represents the different days. As we can see, the blue line actually is control group, and the yellow line is our high concentration of micro 26 a So we can see compared with the control group and negative control group, after we treat melanoma cell with micro 26 a we can see that micro 26 a significantly reduces the tumor size in vivo assay. So here is our conclusion that micro 26 a arrest cell cycle and G0 and G1 phase and induce apoptosis in melanoma cell lines. And the micro 26 a decrease cell viability by directly targeting MITF gene in malignant melanoma cells. And the last one is micro 26 a can reduce the growth of reduce the growth of melanoma in mice. So I would like to thank my advisor, 
Eric A. Senior and also thank my lab mates for assisting this study. Thank you and any questions? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, all presenters, uh, <laughs> professors, <and> photographer. <laughs> you have to be here. So um, today, my topic is an environmental examination for Fortune 500 companies. Um, I know it's too early to talk about this uh, at, at this time of day. Is it a boring topic? Um, let's see this first. watching a bird, a bird. Actually, this bird is called a uh, peregrine falcon. Uh, it is one of the, they're, they're one of the most powerful and fast flying birds in the world. And, and this bird was almost eradicated uh, in the last 20th century due to the pesticide control. But after significant effort has been made by many companies and organizations, this bird right now has been protected from many big cities and coastal areas. One of the companies that helped to protect this bird is also one of the Fortune 500 companies named American Electronic Power. So, feeling better? Let's go. <laughs> Our research aims at, uh, aims at uh, exchange corporate environmental messages with uh, all of the customers and, and uh, internet users. And why do we choose Fortune 500 companies? Um, because they are leaders. They, they, set up, uh, they set up criteria and they, and they are examples. And that's why we use Fortune 500 companies. The rank for the Fortune 500 companies is based on their revenue. And third, where does all the data come from? All of the data we are using directly come from the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, I know that there are other in internal data, but those are the information as a customer that we can require. So 
does our data come from? Part two, methodology. There are two approaches that we adopt in our, uh, in our research. First of all, it's called 14 indicators. And second is called three-level website examination. I will explain accordingly. So 14 indicators. What are the 14 indicators? And why do we use 14 indicators? Let's see this table first. Here. So as you can see right now on this PowerPoint, there are 14 indicators. First of all, it's called LEED. Second, 3RS and LED lighting. And then ISO 14001 and GHG emissions. EPA award, biodiversity, climate change, waste management, water conservation, energy efficiency, environmental education, green power, and land, and land preservation. So those are the 14 indicators we use to examine appropriate environmental approaches. First of all, let's see LEED. So what is LEED? It is a, to, be, uh, to make it clear, it's, it's, a, it's a criteria and it's a certificate. Um, but it's not a normal certificate because leaders around the world that have made LEED the most widely used third party verification for green buildings. And as you can see that there are four levels here. Uh, the basic one is uh, it's called certi uh, cert certified, and next level is lead silver and gold and platinum. So lead, also known as lead leadership in energy and the environmental design, is changing the way we think about energy. We're changing about the concept for green building by by using a series of um, criteria such as GHG emissions and they they issue points for the companies. So based on the number of points each company achieved, a project or a company will receive one of four lead rating, uh, lead rating levels. And lead certificate building are, are very, are right now are very well known and very widely used. Second, um, 3RF and LED system. Those are other two approach we use to examine a appropriate in practical environmental approach. So 3RS is reduce, reuse, and recycle. I directly got this from United States still there on their homepage website. So reduce is to reduce energy consumption. Reuse is to reuse bottles, reuse materials. And recycle, it's, it's, a, it's, very common, it's a very common concept. Next, let, let's move to the LED lighting. As you can see this line, that this move enables, the LED lighting enables Walmart to cut energy for store lighting by another 40%, saving support companies' energy, everyday low prices. And there's a very interesting fact I want to share with all of you. LED costs, it costs more. You know, it costs uh, three to four times as much as normal bubbles, but will last like 10, eight to 10 years. Next to three indicators, um, ISO 14001, GHG, and EPA. So what are those? ISO 14001, as you can see, Apple says that it is a voluntary international standard that, that establishes the requirements for an, an organization's environmental management system. Next, um, GHG is, called, is also known as greenhouse gas emissions. But people know about CO2, right? It's, uh, it's one of the GHG contains CO2 and other air pollutions. So GHG emissions throughout, uh, this is another one of the Fortune 500 com companies. Operations and the value chain reduced the scope GHG emissions by 50 uh, by 200 uh, by 2020. EPA is a word that issued by the, um, that by the Environmental Protection Agency. And as you can see from here, General Motors, no, also known as GM, 
uh, earned the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's 2016 Energy Star Partner of the Year Award. And this is a third, so this is a fourth year in a row that GM won the award. Next, let's move to another concept, very important concept we use to exam, uh, to, to perform our research. It's called three-level website examination. Let's see this first. As you can see, right now I'm clicking uh, uh, the page, right now I turn to Apple's website. This is the home page of Apple. That's where also, also in our research we said the first level of website. And and this is the first this is a home page. And if you if you see this on their home page there is a word here called environment. And in our research we use this word as environmental uh, as environment education. So when you click environment, this page right now is the second level page, no longer a first level page. And on this page, we can see that first of all here is climate change. This is one of the indicators that we use in our research. And next, yeah, next you can see this word, renewable energy which means that also Apple also addressed this issue. And most of the, um, most of the, uh, the, re, uh, the, re, the renewable energy that Apple is using right now is uh, solar, as you can see from here. Five minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this, this page is called second level web page. Mm -hmm. And if you click climate change here, that page will turn to the third level page. So this is a examination. So this is the approach that I wanted to introduce here. It's called three level examination. Okay. So for for the part of our research funding, I want to show you an overall picture first. So for the, for the 500 companies, as you can see from this red part, that 40 almost 40% of the companies in the Fortune 500 companies are environmental highly related company. As you can see from here, it's an overall rank for the 40 indicators. This is the first level rank. As you can see from this page, that that our, uh, our research is based on, for example, the first one, environmental education. So how many, for, for 500 companies, how many, does the, how many times does this word appear on their, home, on their homepage? And as you can see, there are, there are 103 um, companies that show their environmental education on their homepage, which means a first level web, first level web page. And the second level web page, as you can see, numbers are going. And if you, if you see this third level page, you can see that the number peaked to the highest, which means most of the companies that they, uh, they present their environmental approaches on their third or on their second or third level. Let's see this. It's called top 150 companies vs bottom 150 companies. As you can see the number here, there, are, there, there is a significant gap between the top 100, 150 companies and the bottom 150 companies. And which means that uh, for the top 100 companies, there are 110 companies that they acquired the LEED certificate. Well, on the bottom 150 companies, there are only 49 companies acquired LEED certificate. And right now you might be wondering, and how about the companies uh, in, in the middle of the, in the middle, about the 200? I, uh, so in the middle of the 200 companies, as you can see from here, this one we've already seen from the earlier uh, PowerPoint. For the, middle, for the middle 200 companies, there are also ni uh, 91 companies acquired the lead, acquired lead system. And uh, for the second one, it's called GHG. 
And there are also 100, 142 companies acquired that they use GHG emissions to evaluate their environmental approach. As you can see the ramp here, right, the first one the, is the top 100 com 150 companies ranked the first. And the second is the middle 200 companies rank the, rank the second one. And uh, as you can see, the third one came. Uh, so, my conclusion here is, through my findings, we find that, that those leading firms, that they do try to communicate uh, uh, the, a number of different environmental issues. However, most of the companies, that uh, most of their communication occur on the second or third level web page, rather than the company's home page. And from the, last, uh, from the previous per point, so we can also see that there is a clear difference in communicating most of the environmental issues between the firm size, uh, di between the firms of different sizes. Which means, the bigger the size for the company, that the more uh, effort that they made to uh, accomplish their environmental examination. Oh, the time is very limited. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yes, sure. <laughs> it's nice to be quiet. But it's glad to see the forensic science department, and I thank you guys in advance for your support. Um, this morning, I'm going to be talking about the utility of the ROPB gene in the identification of Staphylococcus epidermis isolates from the uh, human skin. Why the human microbiome? In the absence of DNA, human microbiome may be able to provide other information that may lead to a person's identity. The colonies found on the microbiome can provide such information as diet, disease, or drug ingested, for example, legal or illegal. This information has the potential to provide valuable insight to the person and the type of life they may have lived. Studies such as this one can be a determining factor when no other means of identification is available. And I just want to expound just quickly here. The thought process is, what if, the, what if there's no viable DNA that's able to be obtained from a crime scene or just from someone's home or something like that? Can, can the bacterial microbiome of a human skin tell us uh, if they were diabetic? Were they a drug user? Did they take heroin or anything like that? So that's kind of the thought process here. To go through this presentation, I'm going to present a background and the objective of this research, materials and methods, the results, conclusions, and my conclusions. It's just a picture of an uh, average DNA sequence and a picture of what a bacterial microbiome would look like. The 16S gene. There are a number of studies examining the human uh, microbiome for clinical and research applications using the six, utilizing the 16S RNA gene uh, for bacterial species identification has become the method of choice for most researchers. And this is important in the clinical setting more so because of infections, those comical infections from hospital devices, catheters, and things like that. So they want to be able to identify the bacteria. So this, this subject is uh, actually, um, has a, a very unique application um, in, in those settings. And just an example of what a 16S gene may look like. So here's the, here's the background question for my research. Is there another gene within bacterial DNA that can be used to identify the genus of bacterial species? <clears throat> One viable alternative that is gaining popularity is the ROPB gene. Current research suggests that not only can this gene be used for species identification, but it may be used to discriminate molecular variation at the species level better than the 16S RNA gene. And just an example of uh, what a typical gene would look like. The ROPB gene encodes for the beta subunit of the bacterial RNA polymerase. It codes for 13, 1,342 amino acids, and it is the second largest polypeptide of the bacterial cell. And again, the, hypo uh, the, the proposed question was, can the ROPB gene identify and distinguish bacterial genus as well as the standard 16S gene? So what we did was, <coughs> excuse me, what we did was, I isolated um, Staphylococcus epidermidis um, that was identified by a fellow student, Ewan uh, Fung, 
using the ROPB gene sequence. Um, after that, I isolated the, uh, the uh, bacteria using a commercial bacteria extraction kit from Zy Zygmo Research. I amplified the uh, DNA found using PCR and primers that were specific for the ROPB gene. I then ran an agarose gel, and after that, I sent the DNA for sequencing using blast analysis. This is an example of a PCR thermocycler. And the basic diagram of gel electrophoresis, I just wanted to make note that the, uh, with DNA having a negative charge because of the phosphodiester bonds of the backbone, that the DNA would be loaded into wells here and would migrate towards the positive electrode. This is an example of um, the results that I did receive, and I wanted to make note here that if you'll see for the different um, samples that all of, all of the uh, DNA migrated at approximately the same area, the same level. This is an example of a chromatogram, and I'm going to um, explain a little bit more about that when we get to the next slide. Um, and this was given for each of the uh, DNA isolates that we submitted. Okay, the DNA sequence was between uh, 120 to 690 base pairs. And if we go back here, um, let me see, go back here. The, well, what I did was between 120 and 690, I took the, I copied down the uh, actual nucleotide sequences. And we go back to here, and that's what I did here. So once I, once I identified that for each of the 36 um, samples, I was able to then send them off to the uh, BLAST website to actually find out what this sequence um, actually belonged to. And this was the, the these were the results. Um, as you can see, um, the ROPB gene was successfully able to identify Staphylococcus epidermidis uh, on three different recovery times with an identification percentage of 99%. Conclusion overall summary. Unfortunately, the ROPB gene did not show a greater resolving power than the 16S gene. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail when I get to my limitations of this experiment. Secondly, the ROPB gene did not display any greater variation ability than the 16S gene. And uh, I think I can mention that here. One of the reasons why this research was conducted in the first place because one of the limitations of the 16S gene is that it's able to identify a bacterial species but not the subspecies level. And when you're trying to, like I said earlier, um, when you're trying to identify a specific bacteria or you're looking for a specific bacteria, it may not be the actual genus, it may be the subspecies. Well, if the 16S gene can't tell you that, then the information is no good. So what we wanted to see was, well, can the ROPB gene do a better job of that type of identification? Limitations. Um, my fellow student, Yuen Fong, she identified, I know, over a hundred and some odd different types of uh, bacteria on the human skin from her, her own research. One of the limitations of this research is, um, in hindsight, we should have at least taken two separate um, species and compared the results for the ROPB gene. It was a time issue, I know, at the time that I was conducting this research. But looking back, that's what I should have done. I should have uh, at least identified two to see if the ROPB gene had utility in one uh, bacterial species and the other. And always larger sample size. In a perfect world, I would have liked to have had three times as many samples. Uh, but I think, that's a, I think that's a lot of limitations for a lot of research projects. I want to acknowledge Joanne Fine. Uh, she's the one who actually had her own experiment that isolated the um, bacteria. Uh, we Tan actually assisted me the entire summer uh, on this project. I could not, not have done this without her. And Dr. Scott Krupper, who downstairs is called the uh, DNA, I can't say that word, but he's the guru <laughs> <laughs> of DNA. And, and he was the leading force and um, guide, guiding factor for this um, research. These are my references. Questions we've got to give in four or five minutes.
So currently, um, if they're using 16S, is that to broadly like figure out what's there and and then I mean, I mean, wouldn't it be possible then to use like a second marker to be more specific if that was needed, or what's the procedure that's used? Well, the 16S gene is uh, usually used as a universal um, gene for identification because it's present in all bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, we come back to the limitation of the 16S. Yes, we can identify certain at the genus level, but uh, sometimes, and not all the time, but sometimes in certain instances, the uh, 16S cannot differentiate between uh, certain sp subspecies, like Staphylococcus epidermidis, uh, the, the, uh, the bacteria that I did the research on, alone has over you know seven or eight subspecies, and from those subspecies, there are <laughs> further subspecies. So um, 16S can identify bacteria and can identify some of the subspecies in certain um, strains of bacteria, but not for all. Good question. Thank you for asking. Other questions? <coughs> all right. Well, thank, thank you guys so much. much. All right. Hello, everyone. I am Derek Wilson. Uh, it's good to be back here at Poirier State University. Uh, so my presentation is uh, looking at addiction through technology and uh, using sociological theory to interpret some of the reasons why we might be addicted to certain types of technology and in certain ways. <clears throat> so for the purpose of this assignment, um, technology addiction is the constant need of technology including cell phones, computers, internet, and gaming. Now um, obviously there are certain forms of technology that we do rely on and that are a basic necessity of life, especially if you have health reasons or anything else along those lines that would cause you to rely on it. But um, the two types of technology addiction that I looked at were general information technology addiction, which is more similar to gambling addiction than it is like an alcohol addiction. This is mostly due to a um, give and take reward system kind of um, influence that the technology will give you. And we'll get in more a little about that as I um, discuss different theory, theoretical approaches to the technology addiction. Uh, there is mobile communication technology addiction. So this is something I actually looked at quite often in my undergrad, and this affects younger generations specifically. And so good examples of this would be like cellular devices or computers, laptops, something that you can carry with you everywhere. I mean, I have my phone up here with me because I forgot to start the timer to see where the time is. Um, so technology use and age are inversely correlated. This is some of the research that I looked up previously before uh, completing this assignment. And it shows that basically the older you get, the less technology you use. But this is also based on the influence of the rate in which technology has increased. Obviously, younger generations have been growing up with this technology, whereas older generations are learning it at the same exact time that younger generations are. Uh, some of the other information I had found was that um, it affects your sleep pattern, so this is always a constant thing that if you had to look at your phone for half an hour before you go to bed at night or wake up in the morning and you have to scroll through Facebook before you can actually get up and take a shower. Uh, that's from personal experience on my own. <laughs> uh, consequences of addiction can include physical ailments, loss of life, and lack of social skills. These are just some of the side effects of technological addiction. Uh, loss of life being obviously the most extreme, whereas you know physical ailments, if you're staring down for like three hours at your cell phone or laptop or computer at a time, writing papers, things like that can lead to obviously back issues. And then lack of social skills, the more we get comfortable with communicating with somebody through a computer screen, the less likely we are to be comfortable talking to someone face to face. Uh, so as I say again, um, Addiction for the purpose of this project is defined as the risk with using the technology being greater than the reward or the payout that someone might have. Um, risk and reward is defined based on the situation and the type of technology that a particular person is using. Um, so some of the addiction examples and questions that I wanted to ask and look at in this assignment were uh, social media use, so obviously Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, anything like that where you're communicating with the vast public as well as your friends. Um, through technology, texting and driving, so that's looking at more of an interpersonal relationship, and then mobile gaming addiction. And so this looks at, this is kind of more of a macro level theory that we'll get into to use to look at that, but um, it does have some very promising results that also relate back to the um, gambling addiction relation. 
And so my questions that I want to ask were, can micro theory explain the social issues surrounding technology addiction? And if so, which theory is best to use as an umbrella term? And um, this was looking at very much like a contemporary theory set rather than classical. So symbolic interactionism, which is definitely more of a classical theory, uh, works with the self and interpretive work of self and social interaction. So this is basically um, showing how we identify ourselves based on society around us and that society is actually what makes us who we are the way we act. And uh, one specific example of so symbolic interactionism that is more along the lines of contemporary theory is dramaturgical approach. Now what this basically translates to is that uh, you are an actor on a stage. And so every, everybody that is watching you is the audience, but you are the actor, you are center stage. And the, I chose this theory for looking at social media because when you're on social media, you know, your Facebook profile, that's your stage. You're on social media stage. You're the actor, and everything you do, everything you upload, statuses you make, pictures you take, everything along those lines has to do with you trying to win the approval of your audience, your friends, those who can see your public uh, posts. And so it's kind of seeing how, how you're going to make your own image based on what they approve of and what they disapprove of. And this has become even more pertinent in recent times with Facebook's addition to uh, different emojis that you can like someone's status or you can be angry based on someone's status and so forth. So exchange theory uh, actually describes social interaction as an exchange <coughs> and an expectation for reciprocation. This is a, a classic example of this is when you give somebody a birthday gift. There's the idea that with that, you're expecting them to return the favor and give you a birthday gift in return. So failure to reciprocate actually leads to a, la a loss of trust for future exchanges. So this is a, you know, going back to the birthday present. If somebody doesn't give you a present in return, then you're like, well, I'm not going to give you a present next year. <laughs> Unless, of course, you know, you're just really nice and you like giving people stuff. So um, I looked at mobile communication technology addiction and driving. And um, for this example, it's kind of more on the extreme side. But if you imagine somebody is texting and driving, because they're really worried, you know, they say someone's texting you while you're driving and you still have an hour drive. And they're saying, hey, we need to know about this party we're planning and we need to know now, otherwise like we're gonna, like the plans are gonna fall through. So at that point, you're faced with the situation or the, the crossroads. Do you text back, risk your life, risk the lives of those on, others on the, on the road or possibly get pulled over and make sure that you give that exchange in return or are you going to be safe, not text back, possibly lose that exchange trust by the party falling through, all your friends then don't have, you know, like they're, they're upset because it's because of you, the party didn't end up happening. Now, of course, this is obviously a bit of an extreme example, but this, I mean, this, this does occur very commonly. I mean, there's always texting and driving issues that we hear about on the media. So my final theory that I chose to look at was organizational theory. And this is uh, viewing the world from diverse and differentiated organizations seeking to understand as to why organizations change structure and behavior based on adaptation. Now, as I said, this is definitely more of a macro level theory. This is applied to more of a general society as a whole. And um, I actually chose to look at mimetic theory, which implies the idea of homogenization, which is when one group sees that another group is actually becoming very successful so they're going to do what they can to copy that in order to become successful as well. My example of this was Candy Crush, which is a very addictive uh, multiplayer or manipulative and addictive game online. It actually uses psychological manipulative factors like uh, colors that create impulsive decisions within the person being exposed to this type of media. Um, this game was known for the most downloaded and highest earnings for quite some time on very many different uh, record websites. And um, what happened was many other gaming or gaming companies saw this that wow this is successful we need to do what we can to kind of copy this so that way everyone else will want to play because there are certain uh, features of Candy Crush that gamers didn't like such as the fact that there's microtransactions 
which is where you pay money to keep playing the game if you fail so many times. And I know um, my theory professor actually uh, told a story about how his kid raised up over $600 on their cell phone bill because he was, paying, he was playing Candy Crush. And I can't ever imagine spending that much, but that is a lot of money. Uh, so definitely that you see this mimetic approach. They're mimicking <coughs> the Candy Crush saga game and trying to do what they can to kind of repeat it, maybe even trick some gamers or mobile gamers into thinking that, oh, this is just as good, so I'll just keep playing this. So in the end, um, micro theory does explain technology addiction with a few minor errors in each one. Um, the whole purpose of sociological theory is so that we can address social interactions and kind of maybe find explanations and explore possible uh, reasons as to why people do the things that they do. Um, the theory I thought that best explained the overall explanation of any technology addiction in a person is exchange theory. Um, this mostly came from the fact that no matter what situation you're in, whether or not you know it's, it's mobile gaming or uh, texting and driving or even just on Facebook, there's an exchange between the person and whatever is on the other side of that screen. In mobile gaming, you know, you're exchanging money through microtransactions in an attempt to get better scores. And obviously in texting and driving, you're exchanging texts, trying to um, hold that trust between people who are texting you. And then uh, social media, you're posting pictures, you're posting parts of your personal life, if you do, and you're, you're having that trust that somebody's gonna like and give you that self-confidence boost by getting over 100 likes on your new selfie. Uh, and it, it did show that technology addiction is a very dangerous slope. Uh, obviously financially, <coughs> like I said, with my professor's son who spent lots of money. Uh, physically, obviously, there's, there's uh, grave dangers, especially if it is something as uh, drastic as texting and driving. And emotional based on you know, if you have the expectation of getting lots of likes or something on a Facebook or social media website, uploading something personal that you really want to share with people, and then people almost kind of ignore it. So as I said, again, one last time, the exchange theory does do this the best as the, you know, there's always, an, it can explain any amount of exchange between you and the technology that you have in front of you. Those are my sources. So uh, what questions do you have? Um, does, does your theories predict what type of people might be most likely to have a serious addiction to technology? Or could it predict what stage in their life might be most likely to develop an addiction? Uh, if I were to go, I would say out of these three theories, maybe not as much, um, it'd be more, it, there'd have to be more background onto, um, you know, like what more about the person. And then there are also different types of theories that could be used to explain those things individually. Obviously there's um, different theories out there that could explain age and, um, you know, the increasing amount of technology addiction that we have as the younger generations grow older. But um, I think exchange theory, you know, kind of because I've kind of snuck, uh, held on to this one pretty tightly, could do a very good explanation of saying uh, maybe a little bit more of when somebody might be more addicted, just ex but that again, that would have to explore more into what a person is doing in their life that would allow them to, or to enable them to have more of an, uh, you know, the need to exchange and uh, hold that trust. Are there other questions? We have time, and I, yeah, go ahead, please. I've got uh, a couple, too. Kind of bigger than your actual study, so I apologize for that aspect of the question, but um, where does support for research on technology addiction come from? I assume the industry, the technology industry, is probably not too concerned about it. Is it the governmental agencies? Who, what's the story out there? Um, there are actually several different companies. Uh, you know, they, they hire individuals to um, kind of examine these things. Uh, one really good example of this I always like to use is um, companies will hire people to monitor Twitter. Uh, you know, if you really think about all the times, like if you've ever gone to Twitter or Facebook to complain about something, you're like, oh man, that, that Starbucks unicorn frappuccino <coughs> is way too sugary for me. Um, they actually have, like people will hire, co or companies will hire people to monitor that because that's actually one of the main ways that businesses will observe 
uh, customer feedback because you know it's how many times do you go to the store and you get one of those you know circle and go to this website fill out the survey and you know we'll give you ten dollars back well you know people almost never do that but what they do do is go to Twitter on a regular basis or Facebook any social media and either talk about how great something is or they rant about it and how it could be so much better it's not that great and um, so really I think social media is one of the best ways that companies kind of observe um, the how to uh, you know like how to improve does that answer your question so I, I have a I guess a follow-up question to that uh, comment maybe I, I read uh, just this past month in the Atlantic Monthly an article by a, a, a fellow who has carefully researched this topic from a little bit of a different perspective and his argument is 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 that uh, the, the, the companies that create the, this, the, you know, the, these technologies are keenly aware of the addictive nature and they are, they are doing everything they can to capitalize on it. Okay. And, and his article specifically focused on, uh, on, on how the way the screens light up, the, the colors, the patterns, uh, the, the, the movement that happens, how, how they are watching how that, you know, the biochemical almost reaction uh, to, to humans and their test subjects, what what will we have to do to keep people looking at the screen? And now they're they're finding studies now where they're saying like the average human consults his or her cell phone, they say 190 times a day. Oh yeah. Uh, so I mean I mean this is this is looking at. I mean, what are your comments to that? I, I mean, I definitely so. And I, you know, I mean, the economy can do a lot of terrible things to technology and technology development in general. Um, one of my studies that I'm currently doing is over biocybernetic enhancements and the human body, the future of transhumanism, which is the idea and belief that we will eventually augment our bodies through robotic limb replacements or genetic alteration in order to better our human bodies because the idea is that our human bodies are, they're done evolving as far as they can biologically on their own. And um, one of the issues for the future I looked into uh, was actually under the theory of technological determinism which states that at what point, or states that we don't develop technology for the sake of making it better, but we develop it based on economic, political, and cultural demands. Um, and what I looked at in that was how far, or how much longer will it be, you know, right now we're developing uh, robotic enhancements for our bodies for those who need it. Uh, we have like the Blade Runners in the Olympics. We have um, small implants that will allow for, um, you know, I saw something about fixing arthritis. Um, Google right now has a patent for an ocular implant that will constantly correct your vision for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. But at what point will the economy take over and people like that who are trying to manipulate um, technology so that way we are addicted to it, so that way it's more of we don't really care about the people who need this technology to live independently, but we're going to focus on the people who are really rich and they can pay to make their body better than the, the average human body. In, any other questions? We've got a couple of minutes, and I have just one more. It's kind of a follow-up to the wife's question. Okay, so uh, do anybody else? I don't want to. I don't want to be a question mark. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm, I'm watching a TED talk last night, uh, and it's Philip Zimbardo, probably one of the most renowned psychologists of the past hundred years. And he's dealing with this from a gender point of view. He's looking at mm -hmm. the difficulties that males are having today. Mm -hmm. uh, lower GPAs, dropping out of school, not going to college, and, and then there's quite an array of disturbing statistics. And I don't know what his data is, but he's pinning it on the fact that males are far more prone to be addicted to computer games. He makes specific, maybe it's a stereotype, maybe he isn't, to the 25, 30 year old still living in his mother's basement who spends his days uh, playing World of Warcraft, except when he takes a break to view online porn. <laughs> and Philip Zimbardo argues that that is, in his mind, uh, a major determinant, a major factor in, in, in why males are struggling today in the Western world. Yeah. Did you see anything about that? Most definitely not. Um, I'm actually doing a uh, mini project that will, there's like a shadow of what my thesis is going to be next year over uh, technology inequality um, through age and uh, gender. And um, I, the statistics that I just ran said that if you are a male, you are, are you are more like, are you are likely to have spend four more hours a week with technology than if you are a female. And um, there's there's a lot of different factors that could influence it. I do agree that um, uh, you know gaming would be a big one of those. That, but also I think that's 
there's other things to think of as well, uh, you know, cellular devices, there could be different things besides gaming. Um, but I am willing to bet that a large portion of that, you know, even you mentioned pornography, and that is a big one. There are several more uh, males in the world that, at least publicly, that, you know, our data would re would represent or show that, um, that they are more avid users and consumers of pornography on the internet. Thank you, all right. So my name is Aaron Bradditch. I'm Clary Cohen. I'm Samaya McMaidenich. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, psychopathology and musicians. For ages there's been this idea that Musical talent is accompanied by uh, psychological illness or psychopathology. Uh, one example of this is Mussorgsky, and he died of chronic alcoholism, but he was a self-taught composer, a prolific composer. So the existing research is practically non-existent on this topic. We looked in all sorts of databases, and there's, there's really nothing that exists. Like info, I think had something like 30 results. Uh, PubMed, very few, again. We did find a few studies that looked at musicians versus the, uh, the general population. And they looked at anxiety and depression um, in college music students. And they found a, a significant difference in the levels of anxiety and depression versus in musicians versus the general population. However, there was one study that, that found that there was no difference or that musicians actually ranked a little bit below in these levels of psychological illness. So why the differences? Okay, well, all these studies use an ex post facto design. And this just means that there was no random assignment. You cannot say that I'm going to make you a musician today or a non-musician. So there's no random assignment in these studies. But the Mirabic study and the Spahn study both compared musicians to non-musicians. However, Riston only looked at musicians and then compared those levels to a national average for levels of anxiety and depression. This is a lot like comparing show dogs to mixed breed dogs. It's, it's, it's not a valid comparison. So we learned a lot from our literature review. We, use it, we, def we learned that we definitely want to use a, um, established measures. We want to use things like the BDI and BAI. And we want to use a between group comparison. This means we want to look at musicians and non-musicians in the same study. We also want to have a more inclusive definition of musicians than the, our, the predecessors. We want to be able to include people who are not just studying music classically, but also to include self-taught musicians. Uh, we want to include other measures of psychopathology, OCD, and get information on a musical background. And with this, it leads us into our hypothesis um, that college-age musicians are going to experience higher levels of depression, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive symptoms uh, compared to non-musicians. And with that, I'm gonna get a little bit into our method. Um, so we are gathering data from Emporia State University. Uh, we are looking at both music students and then psychology majors within their departments. Um, again, looking at musicians versus non-musicians. Uh, we have a more inclusive definition of musician being anyone that performs vocally or instrumentally, either in public or by themselves, so they are able to self-identify. Uh, and in terms of our materials, we're going to be using the BDI, or we are using the BDI, the BAI, the YBOX2. Um, this is going to be done through a Google form. Um, which we're gonna gather some basic demographic information as well as a musical training questionnaire for those who did identify as musicians. Um, and then there's some incentives involved with that. So the BDI is going to measure symptoms of depression. Um, 
There is a 7% prevalence rate within the general population for depression. We know that it's more prevalent in early adulthood um, and that women tend to experience symptoms up to three times more than men. Another measure, the Beck Anxiety Inventory, is going to measure symptoms of anxiety. Um, and again, we know that the prevalence rate is gonna be between three to 7% within the general population. Um, and we know that's gonna be more prevalent, prevalent in adolescents and young adults. And again, that women are gonna experience more symptoms than men. Um, and finally, our last measure is going to be the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. Um, so this is gonna be measuring symptoms of obsessions and compulsions. Um, right now, the prevalence rate for uh, OCD is 1.2% within the general population. Um, and this is typically associated, this specific disorder is typically associated with depressive um, and anxiety disorders. Um, the age of onset is about 19 and a half years, so right around the population that we're looking at right now with college students. And with that, Clary will explain a little bit more. Yeah, so a little bit more about our procedure. Like all collegiate research studies, we had to gain IRB approval, um, so we've done that. As far as our recruiting goes, like Sonida mentioned, we're looking at students um, in the music department as well as undergraduate students enrolled in a psychology course. So they all complete an informed consent. Um, so that's kind of just describing the study, the limitations as well as the voluntary aspects of the study. Um, so they kind of give that to us. And then again, we're using that definition, not musician versus non-musician. And they self-select this by the definition that we provide. The instruments again that we are using are the BDI, the BAI, and the Box. These are all gonna be administered through Google Forms. Um, and then they're also going to engage in a debriefing sheet, where, which is, uh, we're talking about things like depression and anxiety, which could be possible triggers for some students in this population. So we're providing things like wellness center information, crisis hotline information, those kinds of things to cover that. As far as incentives go, all students engaged in the study will be entered into a raffle in which they can receive various prizes, um, ranging from $40 gift certificates to $20. And those students that are enrolled in the psychology courses will be receiving credit for the courses. So this is kind of just to look at the flow of how our study is gonna go. All students, or all participants in the study are going to engage in that main survey, which is the BDI, BAI, and the Ybox 2. Um, and then they're going to be taken to a question that asks them, are you, are you a musician? We're using, again, that inclusive definition there. Um, and if they answer yes, they will be taken to a mus musician-specific survey, asking things like, how long have you been practicing? What kind of instrument do you practice? Um, and then those who answer no will get directly taken to debriefing. Again, the musicians will be taken to debriefing after that mus musician-specific survey. Looking at analysis of our data, again, we are doing the between group comparison, so comparing musicians to non-musicians by that self-selected definition. And then we're gonna be using correlated t-tests for independent samples to kind of run the data. So we expect to see, again, this is kind of going back to our hypothesis, that musicians will have higher rates of things like depression, anxiety, and obs obsessive compulsive tendencies um, in relation to non-musicians. Some limitations of our study include, obviously, we're just using college students, right? So that might make our results a little less generalizable to the general population. Um, we're also, we can't use random assignment like Aaron discussed before, so that can be a limitation. But if we do find that our hypothesis is confirmed, that is going to lead to some interesting questions, right? So that would call for research as to why this is happening in the music population. Could it have something to do with the training programs that they engage in? If so, that could call for increased screening of mental health issues as well as increased intervention in this population. So there's our references. Uh, we would also like to give some acknowledgments to Dr. Grover as well as Dr. Mer McInerney, our uh, research advisor and the ESU music department faculty for being so accommodating with us and a few others as well. So with that, any questions? So what is the idea? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, yeah, no, please. Oh, don't yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I, I kind of heard the kind of the artistic mind that's, but right. actual mental symptoms is, is, is new to me. Is that, has that been a long-standing belief? Right, well, so there's this idea. I mean, there are a number of, because beyond Mazorsky, there's, there's like Beethoven and Schumann have, have these ideas of like this 
madness that, that accompanies that. And so it's, is that, a, is that just a phenomenon that exists with like these prolific composers or is this something that exists within the, the general population the also? Yeah. And so that, that's the purpose behind the study. And it wanted to look if this is be case specific or, or generalizable. Thank you. So are you concerned at all with um, your very broad definition of musician? Because under your definition, I would be a yes, but I would not typically state that I was a musician. So, I feel like in, in the literature, they qualified a musician as someone who studies music at, a college, at the college level, mm -hmm. which I feel was too exclusive. So it excluded anybody who is self-taught and performs at the coffee shop, or anybody who is self-taught self and practices alone. Uh, but it, it may include people who, who sings at the church, church choir and may not call themselves a, a musician. So, so there's a little bit of overlap. I feel like it, it's better to in, include a little bit more than to be too exclusive. I will follow on to both of those questions. You know, the motivation is this sort of general notion in society about the association of madness and creativity or whatever. And if you have, so are you concerned that your non-composing, you know, musical performers might not you know, might dilute, in a sense, uh, that association or your psychology majors who are, you know, also artists in some fashion, you know, uh, and, you know, people are going to wonder about that, I guess. Right, well, there, there are a number of limitations. One is, is a small sample size, and it would be great to be able to do this where we could compare uh, performance majors, like uh, dancing performance, theater majors, and, and musicians. Uh, recruiting participants is, is one time and cost prohibitive. Uh, uh, but but also, it, it requires a much larger uh, student body to be able to, to be able to do. So there are a number of limitations that we experience. Uh, uh, I, I see I see your point. I I don't think that we can generalize off of such a small sample, and and that's that's again one of the limitations that we do experience. Yeah. So those are a lot of the covariates that you mentioned that um, are going to be again possible limitations to the study. I think the purpose of the study is kind of to get, lay the baseline, the foundation for this type of research, and then from that we can kind of parse out those covariates with hopefully further research. Also. So, so I guess that was that was a follow-up to my yeah. own question, which sure. is because uh, I'm not familiar with these inventories and so on, but do you collect information on like socioeconomic? status and things like that that might differ between the majors and might be related to incidences of depression and we collect general information so um, like things like gender age um, ethnicity those kinds of things um, but as far as socioeconomic status we did not collect that information right. and, th and that may not be necessarily the best indicator in, in college students college students seem tend to group in in one socioeconomic status and then there's there's like maybe their parents differ a little, but, but as, as a group, they, they tend to be in, in one spot. Um, in, in future research, we, we, can, we can definitely look in, in different places and see what those differences are and see how that relates to the data. I appreciate the point. Any more questions? Thank you, everyone, and thank you.